Good morning. I'm Professor Lori Tallarico. A lot of what I'm about to share is based on my own experiences teaching a college freshman first year experience course. However, much of it is the same when I teach writing and literature courses as well. Perhaps you have not had the same experiences. So it's the first day of school, and you walk into the classroom prepared with handouts and a, big sil and a syllabus and a big smile on your face, and you say, good morning, everyone. Welcome to Bergen Community College. Perhaps a few students in the front row will look at you and softly mumble a response. Here or there, a student might look you in the eye, but several won't look at you at all. Some make sideways glances in your direction. Those in the back either have that painfully shy, please don't call on me look, or that I definitely don't want to be here and have no intentions of participating face. And we won't even get into the body language going on. Thankfully, there's usually at least one student who speaks up and shares his or her story. Well, okay, it's only the first day, you think to yourself, and they're as nervous as I am, even though I hope they can't tell about me. Yes, even after all these years, there's a touch of anxiety when meeting a new class on that first day. But you're also filled with excitement and big plans for all you'll teach them this semester, and you'll share that with them, too. Now it's the second or third week of classes, and the same handful of students sit up front, participate, and hand in the work. Some students have already had an absence, and many still come without the textbook or even a paper. But the most painful part is the silence, long, uncomfortable, and frustrating. They may talk to each other, but they sure aren't talking to you. It's horrible to feel like this. You just can't get the class interested or connected. You were so thorough with what you expected, about how the class works, what their responsibilities are, how their grades are computed. And of course, you've offered help during your office hours. You teach with exuberance and humor. You use visual aids and great handouts, but nothing is working. Perhaps you're feeling like a failure, which really isn't true. Or maybe you're angry and blaming those lazy, irresponsible students who just don't care, which is definitely not right. But either way, it hurts. Well, that's how my early experiences started out, even though I was friendly, funny, prepared, and organized. And I was sure I was approachable, open-minded, and fair. From speaking with colleagues, it seems that this is a common scenario, but I knew I needed to change something. And here's what I've learned. Those painful and prolonged silences, that feeling of distance and lack of student engagement, are because students really don't feel safe, and they don't immediately trust us. And why should they? They come to an unknown place, seeing us as yet another authority, a judge who gives grades, another stranger who gets to decide their fate, whose primary interest is in preparing them for the real world in the future. Should they really be expected to be immediately comfortable, reveal themselves, or share anything personal and meaningful? Would you? And how can they feel safe or have confidence when they were just catapulted into a strange new world where people expect them to automatically know how to appear mature, make good decisions, handle time wisely, and be responsible for themselves. How quickly do you adapt to unknown situations, especially the ones you're not feeling prepared for? And even if the students don't have any trust or safety issues, when and where do you think they were taught how to walk into a room and graciously converse with 20 or so total strangers? You know what it's feeling like for you to be there on that first day and you've been doing it for a while. I have a lot of empathy for students today. There's a certain rat race they enter the minute they start college. They come bearing the burden of needing to be successful, and we greet them with the pressure of making potentially life-changing decisions before they even know who they are. Well, I may not be able to do anything about how students think and feel when they enter my classroom, but I certainly can try to make sure that they leave with a different perspective. I want to prepare them for life, not just the world of work. I want to connect with their head and their heart. I want to offer them some ways of thinking about the world and about their place in it, like reflecting on what makes them tick and gaining a sense of purpose and positive self-worth, exploring what makes them happy and what personal values they hold dear. I want them to reflect on merit, not money, compassion, not competition, wonder, not work, imagination, not just reality. 
What I'm suggesting is adding this teaching of mindfulness and the so-called soft skills to our pedagogy as well as to our own consciousness. These concepts once considered irrelevant, but that is no longer the case. Most employees now consider soft skills a practical necessity on the job. As one career specialist put it, having hard skills gets you hired, lacking soft skills gets you fired. Employers expect good listening skills, flexibility, maturity, empathy, a willingness to learn new things, an ability to work in groups, honesty, self-motivation, integrity, and a belief in one's own self-worth, all skills that combine the head and the heart. Practically speaking, then, it is our duty to prepare students for the real world in a way that goes beyond knowing their field. No matter the subject we teach or the guidance we give, we need to bring in the human factor, the head and the heart. For some, there is still great skepticism about bringing mindfulness into the classroom, probably due to not understanding what it means. Though it has its roots in Buddhist meditation, a secular practice of mindfulness has entered American mainstream in recent years. Basically, mindfulness means to develop a present-based consciousness, to live in the moment, learning to pay attention to how we think and feel in the moment, rather than being plagued with constant negative self-talk and a rehashing of the past that keeps us in a state of anxiety or fear. It means to think before we act and not make rash judgments, to do some inner work and reflection on who we are and what we're here for. Ultimately, hopefully, to feel that we are all connected by our human experiences. There is growing evidence that contemplative education can prepare a student to be attentive, focused, and attuned to both their inner life and outer existence while becoming compassionate toward themselves and others. Studies have shown that practicing mindfulness reduces negative emotions and stress levels and might even stave off mild depression as well as help to regulate emotions. It lowers aggression and frustration and increases feelings of positive well-being. Needless to say, these skills can greatly transform the classroom experience as students display better listening skills and focus, a greater sense of confidence and maturity in their interactions with each other. This can lead to positive community building at its best. In the fields of neuroscience and psychology, studies are now showing powerful benefits. Rick Hansen, in his latest book, Hardwiring Happiness, explains how you can use the power of self-directed neuroplasticity to build up a lasting sense of ease, confidence, self-acceptance, kindness, self-love, and inner peace. Hansen goes on to show how by activating and practicing certain mental states, positive neural traits become installed in the brain. Synapse by synapse, you build your brain capacity. They say neurons that fire together, wire together. In other words, you can learn to deliberately prolong and even create the experiences that will shape your brain for the better. Students can be taught to apply these skills to studying and fire up the brain while building neural connections. Not only more information can be retained, but the habit of studying and retention will be reinforced. So in the face of all this evidence, it seems irresponsible to not include these concepts and approaches in the classroom conversation. But how to begin? For me, it's to have students learn to trust me and know that I am sincere in what I say and do. I need to be vulnerable if that's what I expect of my students. I never ask them to do anything that I wouldn't do or share anything that I wouldn't share. On the first day, I talk about how, even though no one will say it out loud, they are nervous to be here, and so am I. I tell them that I am modeling what it looks like to take a risk. Then I disclose information about myself, like the fact that I dropped out of my first semester, or that I failed two math courses, that I went to this very same college while working full time, and went on to win a scholarship to an Ivy League university. I share how uncomfortable I am while I'm actually disclosing my personal life, but how I do it anyway because the benefits outweigh the risk. I encourage questions and talk about how hard it is to live up to your parents' expectations, especially if you are the first in your family to come to college. How they'll need to make a real commitment to succeed and a plan, because it truly isn't easy, but it definitely can be done. But I also tell them that I promise to be there with them in every way. I contact them if they're absent, push them to get their books right away, and meet with each student individually within the first few weeks to establish meaningful relationships. I get to know something special about each of them, 
I ask about their dreams, their fears, and their plans. These initial conversations allow me to connect in a deep and personal way and make specific and meaningful references and discussions or comments on their assignments. When students feel that you know them as individuals, you've shown concern and kindness, the classroom atmosphere changes dramatically. And that's when I feel I can really teach them and the real teaching begins. It's what Parker Palmer calls the capacity for connectedness, mine and theirs. We talk about what motivates us or holds us back, how we might subconsciously sabotage our own goals and dreams. We share our fears and feelings of inadequacy and the negative self-talk and baggage that weighs so heavily on our psyches. And we write about these issues and come to see that in our humanness, most of us share these same thoughts and feelings, ideas we never thought we'd say out loud, never mind share with someone else. And then we go on to the harder work, figuring out how to change what we now know about ourselves. Students are hungry to thrive and succeed. They genuinely want to know how to make positive change. I share how I've learned to work smarter, not harder, and how getting help shows my strength, not my weakness. I talk about educational theorists like Dr. Dweck, who show how new abilities can be cultivated if we learn to open ourselves to having a new mindset. How attitude and aptitude are two different things. How learning, how to learn can change their skill set. So in addition to any information I can share with them and any readings and exercises I'll supply, they see me as a responsible model of all I've asked of them. I share my thoughts and experiences, my pains and confusions. They see me as a work in progress, just as I see myself, just as I see them. This is risky and uncomfortable, but totally empowering, and we're all in this together. I take the first risks, and hopefully they follow. I'm available, and I tell it real, and they know they can ask me anything. As Parker Palmer explains, as I teach, I project the condition of my soul onto my students, my subject, and our way of being together. The bonds we create, the community we become, are all like no other experience in the classroom. To me, this is teaching and learning at its best. So I bet you're thinking, this works in every class? No. And you get every student to buy in? I wish. And you never get resistance or students who are on cooperative? Of course I do. But I'm OK with that. Because you never know when the seeds may sprout. You never know when a message may have gotten through, even if a student fails that course. And I can live with that. I consider it my responsibility to model who I am and what I stand for in the hopes that students, too, will one day do the same. So here's my reward. On the last day of class, when I asked them to share their dreams and goals, some will mention plans like, I want to continue finding myself, or I'm preparing to live a better life than my parents have, or I want to become a citizen of the world and do something meaningful, or I want to be a role model to others by showing kindness and compassion, or I want to use my creativity and curiosity in an original way, or even, I'd just like to be content and live a happy life. Thank you.